Hey Skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. And I'm Bob, how's it going? Uh, welcome to our 2023 Touring Ski Comparison. Um, this is one that we get a lot of questions asking us to, yep. to cover. Um, and Bob and I were kind of chatting about it before we started filming. I, Bob has some thoughts, <laughs> I have some thoughts. Um, one of mine was kind of similar to powder skis, like when you hit these what I'll call it, like fringe categories of skis, it feels like there are less differences between them. And even with your powder ski thing, the this side of the wall, the 120s Right, exactly, of the world. specifically yeah. those super yeah. wide ones, um, kind of because the application, like when you're in deeper snow conditions, you're right. probably not gonna notice like subtle differences between skis. And I kind of feel the same way about like this section of skis over here. Yeah, and maybe the last, handful on the on this side as well sure just kind of a, a you know more of a similarity in that grouping right yeah so we may not have as profound thoughts about <laughs> some differences between these skis but i think it's a fun discussion anyways yeah and kind of where i'm going is like there's many different types of touring right and your additional equipment also plays a big factor when right. we're talking about alpine skis you're generally getting an alpine boot and an alpine binding but right. that couldn't be further from the case with these two dozen skis on the wall here right. there's also a huge array of binding and boot choices you can make to put a different spin on any of these skis so that's one thing another thing is where you tour and what your main idea of touring is sure from one up and down resort lap in the morning to days long european hut to hut trips and even so far as round and a racing right you know there's just a whole lot of differences between touring as a ski category right so even within that i think there's just a lot of differences in this thing that you need to kind of you know kind of self-evaluate like what am I doing am I you know here in Vermont you're either touring at the resort or if the snow is good you're doing pretty short backcountry laps you yeah know, with like, like some minor exceptions right if somebody's doing like the vast trail yeah but that's yes I but think I agree with you it's very different than someone that lives in like the Pacific Northwest Definitely. and they're skiing like up a huge volcano Definitely. and down right. a huge volcano. Like there's just, uh, there's huge differences between what people are calling touring. Yep. And you know, that kind of leads to another thought about, you know, the marketing of, the, of these skis. And we talk a lot about that uh, and how these skis are presented to the customer from a brand standpoint. And I think that we, you know, we'll do a, a decent job of pointing that out when applicable, but Overall, it's just an interesting thing to talk about. Yeah, totally. There's a lot of customization up here, yeah. like you said. What you know, what bindings you're choosing, what boot you're choosing, and I would even go as far as saying like your outerwear choices. Sure. Like if you're just if you're wearing like a randonnée race style set of outerwear, that's a lot different than somebody like wearing the same shell jacket and pant that they'd wear to the resort. Right. Like it, so that's. Anyways. Yeah, there's a lot going on here. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, it's a fun conversation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you're if you're wondering like, well, it doesn't seem like there are many differences between those skis, like you're kind of right. Right. So that said, we'll get right into it. <laughs> on with the wall. <laughs> yep. Um, and I think we'll, we'll do this a little different instead of taking turns. We'll kind of just discuss them together. Sure. Um, this is the Fisher Transalp 90C. We are going to lightest, from lightest to heaviest, if you haven't picked up on that. Um, and this one being the lightest, we're sub 1,240 grams. And to me, this is like, this is a real touring ski. And by real touring ski, I mean your focus is uphill. Efficiency. Uh, uphill efficiency, yep. yeah. 90 underfoot, very, very light. Um, something that's really interesting and totally a theme that runs through pretty much the entire wall here and i think this is one of those one of the reasons why this is a fun video to do because this stuff probably doesn't come across on paper this thing is insanely stiff yeah like for night for 90 underfoot for that weight it, it's 
it's unbelievable how stiff they can make these skis, and you kind of want that in the backcountry. Right. You brought up touring. When you're going uphill, if you're on a softer ski, it just feels like mushy and right. inefficient. Like you're losing a lot of energy and how much the ski yeah. is flexing. Like a, like a Vision 98. And we'll see it. Yeah. yeah, we'll see it in a couple skis up there. But very light, very stiff, very precise here in this Transalp 90. Yeah, and Fisher does a great job with milling their, their cores. Yeah. You can really see it in how these things so are cool. shaped. And that, and you know, that's a Fisher thing that we've talked about with like the rain, older Ranger. Yep. So like skis. arrow shape. Yep. The arrow shape, shape. and then milling vertical s like slits in yep. the ski to reduce weight. So, you know, that's kind of a Fisher thing. Um, you know, they're, they got their own skin attachment points on this one as well. Um, so really that uphill efficient skier is going to get, get what they want out of this. Yep. No, you know. great choice. Yep. If you're if that's your focus, you know, you you don't care as much about the downhill feel. Yeah. Not that they, these feel terrible on the downhill, but you know, as you kind of move through this wall, I'd say you can say like you probably have more and more focus on downhill performance the further that way you go. Yeah. And even between this ski and a Hannibal 96, you know, you're giving up a little bit of weight, but you're gaining some downhill capabilities. Yeah. And interesting that they share very similar technologies in terms of construction, right. but like the milling process of that Transalp is on a different level than what we see in the Hannibals. Well, and I think it's interesting, and again, another trend, like you see <clears throat> a lot of similarities on this wall in the situations where we have two skis from a single brand. Yep. So we had that same conversation with this ski and how it relates to the blaze before oh, I hand it yep. to you. Um, <laughs> and this ski, it's that long, long tip rocker profile and very flat underfoot. Right. So this is the vocal Rise Beyond, Rise Beyond 96. They also have that Rise Above 88. Yep. So if we had the Rise Above 88 up here, we would be talking a little bit more like we just talked about that Transalp 90 a little bit more focused on uphill efficiency, being really lightweight. That said, this thing's still really lightweight, 1,290 grams. Yep. Um, Multi-layer wood core in this ski. I love how Vocal's technology, like the same name can be used in a number of different skis. It's just the actual materials change. Right. But the way that they're kind of like pressing a bunch of different types of wood together to control the, the, the flex pattern and all that stuff. And I think flex pattern is an interesting conversation in this ski because it's a little bit softer. Yeah, a little rounder in that flex. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is kind of rare among at least this side of the wall, all the skis over here with me. So if you're looking for a little bit more say, forgiveness and maybe not as concerned with like maximizing uphill efficiency, this is still going to be a very, very efficient ski. But I think it's going to feel a little bit more supple, a little bit more fun on yeah. the downhill in my opinion. Yeah, and you can tell that in the in the tip shape as well, where you're totally. just a little bit wider here, you know, a little bit more of that downhill influence going on in the shaping of this ski while keeping that weight to a minimum. Yep. So interesting to talk about and like, you know, this also has that 3D turn radius. Yep. So again, Vocal is incorporating a lot of their technologies from their Alpine skis into their touring category, which is always a smart idea. Yep, and I'm glad you brought up turn radius because that's another theme in this <coughs> category is a lot of them use very long turn radii. And this one in the tip, it's 24. Yep. So you see a lot of that to kind of counteract how light the skis are. If you had a ski that was this light or as light as a lot of the skis up here with like really extended side cut and the tips and tails, it would feel unbelievably twitchy. Yep. It would just like hook up and do things when you didn't want it to at all. And there are skis up here that do have those short radius. A lot of these things do follow more of a twin of their Alpine counterparts. And we can kind of talk about that when we get to them. But, yep. you know, skiers that like that, that type of shape yep. are going to gravitate towards that ski. Yeah, and it's also it's interesting to see that you get those shorter turn radii as skis get heavier. Yep. Because then you're, you're counteracting that, that potential yeah. twitchiness. Yep. But great ski. You know, another thing that we can talk about as we go through here, like we did in the intro to the video, is customization, binding choice. You know, I think this is still even like you're, you're in the alpinist world from marker yeah. here rather than the kingpin world. I think seeing what a lot of, 
more professional oriented skiers do with pin bindings, you know, kind of, I think that that pin has kind of gravitated this way. On that one, totally. You know, yep. as that technology has improved, yep. as skiers have put more, you know, emphasis on, you know, the uphill efficiency saying, well, I don't want to lug a Duke PT-16 up this hill. Right. And I, the skiing is fine. Right. You know, you see these professional skiers skiing these pin bindings. I want to have some confidence in my mind that it does it. Totally. So. And I think you hit the nail on the head with just the technology has yep. gotten to the point where they're more trustworthy. Yep. Uh, here we got the K2 Wayback 96. Um, you know, like we said at the beginning of this video, especially these first few skis over here are pretty darn similar. Yeah. So we're only ticking up what? 20 or 30 grams from, from the last ski that we looked at. So we're just over 1300 grams, call it 1310 in this way back. Um, these have long been a favorite of mine in this category. Um, it's, it's in the family for me. My brother's always been a K2 way back skier. Uh, and this pretty much just carries that same exact conversation from the skis we looked at. But I think one of the notable things in this ski is that 22 meter radius. Yeah, so pretty long. Pretty darn long yeah. here. Um, and then I've always really enjoyed the shape of these skis. A lot of these skis, you're gonna get like a flatter, kind of more precise tail. A lot of people want that in touring. But I think this ski does a good job of blending precision and strength. You know, like it, I always think about if you're traversing above like a no fall zone, yeah. you don't want the ski to feel too loose. So it's still strong and trustworthy, but I really like the rocker profile and that kind of smooth early taper to the tip shape. Just find it gives it a little bit more of a maneuverable feel. And interesting how this Wayback 96 differentiates itself from their new uh, touring line, the Dispatch from K2. Yeah, very different applications. Yeah, totally. And that's kind of what, you know, at, at the beginning saying, well, these are, there's different things people can do on these skis. Yep. And even within K2, it's interesting that they can have a Wayback 96 as well as a Dispatch 101 within their catalog, and it makes sense. You know, yep. kind of similar to, you know, Rise Beyond and Blaze. Yep. You know, those are complementary lines. Yep, 100%. And, like, I'm excited to get to Dispatch because I think that world of touring skis has evolved a lot in yep. the past, like, three to four years. Um, another one that's, like, I thought, it just, I can't get over how stiff some of these skis are. Yeah, I mean, a lot of carbon in a lot of these skis, you totally. know, and that's just giving you that nice stiff flex to it. Yep. Um, you know, obviously when they're using carbon to go along with lightweight wood, it's really going to really affect good. like the pinginess of yep. the ski in a downhill format. But again, the emphasis being on the uphill efficiency in that application. So there's got to be a give and take. It's also impressive, like how many of these skis use metal. Right. While still staying pretty light. Yep. In this ski, we've got a little bit of metal underfoot. You know, all, that often just helps with binding retention, but I think it always gives you a, a little bit more confidence. Yeah. You know, it just feels a little bit smoother right under your foot, and that that's a, a really important part of a ski is, is how it feels right under your foot. Yeah, no, I agree. And even just like when you have a pin binding on there, and you're like, man, I just wish there was a little bit more something right. just to make me feel better about it and right that's what it's for yep and same is true with this ski yep in this ski we get what nano titanal there's a lot of nano going on in this escaper 97 nano <laughs> yeah so i really like this ski um you know this is like maybe a good opportunity to to bring up like i kind of wish we had more opportunities to spend longer duration on some of these skis you know take rosignal for for example like when we were looking at their skis last season, we spent a lot of time on Sender. Yeah. Because that is, there's a bigger market for those skis. So when we're talking about it to you guys, we feel like there are more of you that are going to be interested in our thoughts on Senders. Like, I would have loved to spend more time on this ski last year because I think it's really cool. Um, and we've talked about it a bunch in the past day or two and, and even just this morning it's like a it's a modern sky seven right and they're really selling that backcountry part of that exactly you know, they're it's, taking it's, that sky mentality and, and like 
taking it further along yeah. the line of like yep. what it sh what it should have been in the first place, right. in my opinion. And I say that uh, before I take it off, 1,330 grams. So we're still very, very light yeah. here. 97 underfoot. And if you guys remember that Sky 7 shape, that's really the thing that caught my eye is this tip profile just screams Sky 7 to me. Basically the same width underfoot. This ski has a 19 meter turn radius, which I can't remember off the top of my head what the Sky was. I thought it was short -ish. I think it was shorter, but yeah. not like tremendously short. And then a very similar tail shape too. So if we think about what the Sky 7 was good at, it was good at being really agile yeah. and, and extremely easy to kind of pivot and maneuver through trees. And I think this is a, a great ski for that too. Yep, they use basalt in here. So like basalt Nan nano fibers, basalt. nano basalt, excuse me. So, you know, we're seeing materials carry through from both their alpine skis for lightning yep. as well as cross country. So a lot of their cross country skis use basalt. Yep. So really just a, that light, flexible material, a little bit damper than carbon. Yep. So it gives the ski a slightly different feel. Yeah. Um, also cool to see, you know, just talking about notch. the skin fixation points. Yep. And that's more of a thing on that side. Yeah, you see it almost get over through, here. well, not all of them, but most. Except for that vocal. No, even this has a little. Oh, it's got a thing? Yep. Oh, nice. It's really, I would say, the way back, because yeah. this is more of a tip rivet than a connection yeah. point. Yeah, and most of these have pre-cut appropriate skins, so... You know, they make a Nano 97 skin in a 176 or whatever, 177 or whatever yep. this is, and you <clears throat> throw it on the ski and go. Um, so it's pretty convenient. Yeah, this is, I like this ski a lot. I don't know if you guys noticed me flexing it, but it's um, it's not as stiff as, say, the Transalp or the Wayback. Yeah. Not quite as soft as that Vocal. So a very well-rounded flex pattern in this ski. Take that, add in the weight, and we're getting into what I would say is a noticeably smoother point. Yeah. And that's that's kind of the conversation here. You're you're giving up weight for smoothness. Right. It's a good way to think about it. Um, zero G95 here from Blizzard. So <clears throat> this is pretty interesting. We've talked about Blizzard a lot over the past year, mostly in reference to the hustle skis. And something that I like and I think is very interesting is how Blizzard has a ski that's almost on the far left side of this wall as well as a ski that's almost on the far right side of the wall yep. and would maybe maybe raise the question, do they need a ski that's right here? Well, they, I don't know. Right. And they also have the 85, which would have been would it be further, further this that way. way. So. so I don't know that they need it. I think it's just interesting to yep. like look at those things. So 1,340 grams here in this Zero G95. This is the latest version with Carbon Drive 3.0. I owned this ski with Carbon Drive 2.0 and I've always been impressed by how Blizzard keeps the weight really low but gives this ski like a surprisingly surfy feel. And it's, I think that like, that's another thing why this conversation is really interesting is because if you just look at this ski on paper, nothing about it like screams surfy. Right. There's not much rocker in it. The thing that does it is, I don't even think it's listed on my ski. I think it's listed on your ski and I believe it's a 24 meter turn radius. It sure is, Jeff. So that's really where to me you're getting that surfy feel and it was something that always impressed me about my skis is they're very easy to release the tail edge. Yeah. And I don't think everybody understands that in the ski world still, is that the longer your turn radius, the easier it is to release your tail edge yeah. and get the ski to pivot. So although this ski is still very precise and very trustworthy in a backcountry environment, it still has some looseness to it. And like amazingly, this 3.0, they even removed carbon from the tips and the tails. Yeah. And even with removing carbon, it's so stiff. I would say this is this just along crazy. with like the DPSs are some of the stiffest skis on no, the No, just wall. wait till we get to the DPS. You'll laugh when I try and stiff th uh, flex them. Yeah, you already almost lost an arm today. I almost yeah, I almost <laughs> lost an arm. Um, but great ski. You know, we're still in the the tech tech pin binding side of the of the spectrum here, yeah. in my opinion. Um, but I'd say you're gaining a little bit of strength here yeah. compared to most of the things that we've looked at so far. So although it's still surfy and maneuverable, it's stiff. 
and yep. they pack enough carbon in here that it's actually like less pingy than you might think for I, how much carbon is in it. Yeah, that was kind of the knock on the 2.0 was that right. this was just really pingy up front. And now it's got a great sound. Yeah. So they made it a little bit more supple, but still, man, like super it's, stiff. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Like stiffer than a bona fide. Yeah. It's got to be. Yep, and that's how the, that's just, that's the carbon talking right there. Right, right. And we've had those conversations before, like metal does not necessarily make a ski stiff. Right. It's core thickness and carbon and materials like yep. that. Um, really good ski to kind of transition to off that 0G95, because this, I feel like, is basically Fisher's take on the same thing. We talked about that Transalp. Now we're in the Hannibal 96 here. And this is really starting to provide... Similar with the Zero G, in my opinion, more like more free ride influence in how they ski. Yeah, and I think that this being the narrower of the Hannibal, we kind of talk about yep. that. This like whether where it sits in the line in right. the 96 versus the 106, it has that free ride capability of the 106, but in that narrower package. Right. Um, <clears throat> still moving up in weight incrementally. 1,380 grams here, uh, and I think the shape of these skis is pretty darn cool. I really like the round rocker yeah. profile on the tip. I think that's somewhat of an outlier among the skis up here. Um, the rest of the shape is fairly straightforward, but I like that I like that gradual rise in the shovel on these skis. Um, still pretty darn stiff here. Ooh, you can feel that, hear you that. feel nice. that carbon. Yeah, first flex there. Um, but a little bit more of a supple flex pattern than the zero G. So where the zero G is going to feel more responsive, maybe a little bit more serious. I think yep. this has a little bit of playfulness to it, which I think is great. Yeah. And giving it kind of a little bit more of that durable nature, uh, we do see a metal tail here as yeah. well. So kind yeah. of a little upgrade for the Hannibal, just upping the durability and the power uh, for that skin fixation point, just giving you little bit better of a thing to kick back on when yep. you're climbing. Um, <clears throat> 22 meter turn radius on this ski. So very similar overall to that zero G. You and know, one's a little bit softer with a, you drop in two meters out of the radius. Right. The other's a little stiffer and a little straighter. And they're still milling the wood vertically in this to reduce weight, just not as dramatic as that Transalp, especially in the midfoot area. Yeah, so that Transalp, that's a good point, Bob. You know, I don't know if it'll come through as well as I would like on camera, but this underfoot section where they like, I mean, the only reason to do that, because I guess now I'm thinking of other <laughs> reasons, but it really, the, the focus there is to shed weight. Right. Might give it a little bit of a bigger sweet spot too, let it flex a little bit more underfoot, but you don't see that in this ski, where we just get more of a consistent consistent milling of the core from tip to tail. Yeah, and again, that's a, that's something that they do in their cross-country skis. So it's interesting to see what parts of cross-country companies borrow from and what parts of Alpine yeah. to make this category. No, it's and cool. It's the touring world is just like, it's like two, two very different ski yeah. communities coming together, at least from a technology and engineering perspective, right. which I think is very interesting. Yep. Um, next ski here is the Atomic Backland 100. This ski's been around for a while now. We've talked about it a number of times. Um, and Bob, I think you agree with me, and you can you can correct me if I'm wrong. This is like one of the only skis on this side of the wall that feels like it might have some resort application. I think we've crossed a threshold here. And I think there are some skis that we might go back the other direction. Correct. Like, I don't know that there's resort application no, for this, these, but this... It's a little bit of an outlier, um, especially in the 1400. This is the totally. 188, 1402 grams on the scale. Right. Like, it's amazing how light they make this thing. This is also the first ski that is a platform share or a, a footprint share. With Maverick. With, with a Maverick, with an Alpine ski. Right. Um, so this is the same dimensions as Maverick 100 Ti. Uh, it had it's a little bit flatter of a rocker profile, and then it uses that lightweight wood core with the carbon backbone as opposed to the two metal layers. Yep. Uh, but we've also talked about how thin they make their core profiles. Very thin. In Maverick, which yep. is what makes it such a light ski with metal, that theory also goes into Backland. 
but with that carbon backbone really makes this thing super snappy and energetic. And, you know, for, you know, on that side of the wall specifically, but almost for the whole wall, one of my favorite skiing skis. Yeah. You know, super grippy, really fun, really energetic. Uh, can't say enough good things about this thing. Yeah. It's got the Horizon Tech in the tips. I think um, that helps a lot in the resort application, yep. the Horizon Tech. I think Horizon Tech is a great feature on Atomic Skis, and I think it's particularly beneficial when you get this light. Yeah. Because it takes away that more of that pinginess. Yeah. But definitely a great option for a resort tourer. Yeah. Someone who's going doing an uphill lap and then going to the lift. Right. Like, I think that that's a really nice application for this and ski. And you can still put a tech binding on here. You can put a tech binding, you can put an alpine binding. This is like the first ski that we've seen that you can, that the sky's the limit for binding choice. Right. Just a universal appeal. Right. I know I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again, and maybe this will be the last time. I don't know if Atomic's changing this ski or not. <laughs> if they're not, I'll probably tell it again. It was probably three years ago at an industry event, and... Sometimes I don't like this when, when companies get really salesy. Yeah. But like Atomic just they kept like kind of like physically like grabbing my coat and stuff and being like, you have to come ski the Backland 100. And like throughout the day, I was like, no, I don't want to do that. Right. Like I'm not here to test touring skis. Like stop, stop bothering me. <laughs> and then finally, mostly just to like oblige them, I was like, okay, give me the Backland 100. And I think it was my last run of the day at Waterville, I think. I was blown away. Yeah. I was just like, I'm so sorry that I've been blowing you off all day. Like, that ski is incredible. Yeah. And I think it's really cool. Yeah, totally. And, and you know, definitely more of the marketing side of it that keeps this thing in the touring cat catalog. Like, it's really just a lightweight alpine ski. Right. I think. Yeah. No, I think so, too. And I don't necessarily know why it feels that way. Just, yeah, it, it just seems to. They managed to make a really light alpine ski. Right. And that's great. And like this ski, I don't know that it feels the same. No, I think it feels quite the opposite. I think there are some arguably more benefits to this ski as a touring ski, if you want to kind of focus on that. But yeah, it doesn't, for whatever reason, it doesn't feel as good as in the resort as the Maverick, or as the, uh, the, back. as the backland here. Certainly not as a Maverick. Um, we're still under 1,400 grams here. These so are two are like very close, but that's the 188. Very close. Grams yep. per centimeter. Grams per centimeter, that's a little lighter. Um, this is Alon's new touring line. We talked about it last year. They did some really cool stuff with this central carbon rod that kind of sits above the core. And I think like the highlight of these skis is how nimble and how precise they are. Yep. Like I love how how reactive and how quick they feel like I can't really think of much much that I would want that this ski doesn't have if my goal was getting as many east coast touring laps as I could right like, so, I like this weight I like the feel I like how quick it is in bumps and trees and all the tight terrain that we have here on the east yeah and you don't need a hundred on where we exact, are exactly. most days. Right. So that's where the quickness of this thing comes into play and totally. it's a real benefit of this, you know. And it's different, I think that this is a different cry from a regular Ripstick 88. I think versus, so too. You know, this is a ski that shares the same name. But not, yeah, no, but not else. much else other than that. Yeah. Yeah, it has a different feel. Um, also something that's interesting about this ski and somewhat of an outlier as we've gone through this wall so far, 17.6 meter turn radius in here. Yeah. So that's another reason why it just feels like a great kind of Eastern touring ski is you're less off, you're less likely to be in really deep soft snow here in the East. Right. Where a shorter turn radius like this may be more beneficial because you're skiing down on old snow. Yeah. And then you kind of value more from that rounder turn shape rather than the ability to release the tail edge in deep snow. But great skis. Yeah, and a smart use of keeping that carbon tube, Yeah, you know, that type of technology intact and flowing through. Very smooth and really good counterflex. Yeah, but without, like, infringing on the regular ripsticks kind of personality. Yep. 
And I also think like, you know, we I think we said a lot of great things about Backland. Yeah. I think this this feels a little smoother in how Alon's able to to kind of capture those vibrations yeah. in those rods. So if you're kind of, you know, thinking about where this ski would outshine Backland, I think it's in vibration damping. It's just for something for some reason that just that ski just like Maybe it's the conditions that I've skied it in in the resort. Yeah. It just works. No, it's all about sacrifice. And are you willing to get more energy and more pop and flotation out of the 100? Or do you want that smoother feeling from the Elan? Right. Exactly. Really, inter we're getting into more of an interesting discussion here, I think, in my opinion, rather than lightweight right here yeah. where, where you were like yeah these are great lightweight touring skis like this ski feels a lot different to me than the ripstick the application is probably fairly similar but how it's going to ski is quite a bit different yeah and i think tracer fans were sad to see their tracers go in favor of locator but yeah but it makes sense i think it makes sense yeah so we, we've got armada locator 96 here um pretty long radius in this ski so 21 meters we're back to that kind of more soft snow focused feel, yeah. in my opinion. Um, we may have gotten that weight. No, no, weigh the other one. The progression. Maybe we have some variables. And... Yeah, that's yeah. interesting. There we go. Yeah, a little bit of variety between <laughs> those two skis. So we're just over 1,400 grams here. The one you're holding was, what, 1,380? Yeah, it's amazing the variance, even from ski, one to, ski, to, one one ski, ski. to one ski to one ski. Yeah. I think maybe, like, hopefully that doesn't surprise people because yeah. that happens in ski construction all the time. Yeah. How much epoxy is retained in the ski, stuff like that. You Different can, wood grain. It, exactly. Impossible can, to make consistent. Yep. You can see a variety in, uh, in weights pretty easily. Um, more of a soft snow focus tip shape in here, too. Yeah. I, this is our first time talking about taper. Yep. Um, well, yeah, sure. You can I talk talked about it in the rosin gold. Yeah. But... I think this is more pronounced in yep. locator and even gets more so when we get to the wider versions yep. of this. Uh, really makes this thing track smooth and straight through the snow. Uh, very impressive skis. You know, I skied the 104 and the 112. I think that 104 is kind of a sweet spot for soft snow. This is definitely more of your uphill dedicated ski, uh, more versatility. but. Both have great feels, like the tip just the floats right through, really smooth tracking. Yep. Love that about these skis. Yep. Um, also interesting that both Armada and K2 gave us brand new, can we call them hybrid touring lines? You can call it whatever you want. We'll call it hybrid touring lines. They, it felt like they had similar goals, yep. and the skis are kind of similar too. Um, it's really like the way that I think about that between locator and dispatch is dispatch is going to or locator is going to be a little bit lighter across the board. Yeah. So if you're looking at similar widths, so that's a good way to choose between the two. They're both going to have very similar feels. Dispatch gets even longer in turn radius. Yep. So that's kind of another way to think about it where this ski is going to be lighter, a little bit easier when you're kind of making those rounder turns. Dispatch is a, a super unique tool, which I'm excited to get to. Yeah. So, great ski here from Armada, mm -hmm. and I like what they did, um, replacing that tracer line, like Bob said. With the success of the new declivity skis, I think it made sense to further differentiate this line of their skis. There was a little bit too much overlap, in my opinion, between tracer and declivity. Yeah, no, this is definitely a better, a better separation. Pretty interesting ski here, Bob. Uh, yeah, we've talked about line, you know, and their kind of willingness to let the skier choose yeah. how they are going to use their product, whether it's the blade being a short carving ski that also has a twin tip, or like a Sakana that's a 105, right. 15 meter turn radius with a swallow tail. Slalom powder ski. Slalom powder ski, yep. or the Vision series, yep. which they don't have a touring marketing category like a marketed right. touring category they said this is our 98 millimeter underfoot lightweight ski right you want to put a touring bind binding on it and go in the backcountry be our guest if you want yep. to put a marker griffin on it and ski at the resort wonderful but the you know the beauty is in the simplicity 
of kind of letting the skier choose, which yep. I think is really fun and, and kind of an outlier in terms of company. Um, you know, one of the only ones that we deal with that doesn't have, that doesn't say, this is our lightest ski, therefore it's our touring ski. Right. And really the story here, beyond the story that Bob just told, is this ski is very, very soft, and it is the most twin tip specific shape up here. Yep. So it's pretty rare to find, actually I guess that Enforcer 104 gets pretty close, but I still think this is more of an abrupt rise. Um, it's pretty rare to find a twin tip that's like really light enough to do significant touring on. Yep. So if you like that skiing style, if you've got kind of a freestyle background, you like doing 180s and stuff like that, this is a really good ski. Um, just under 1500 grams, so we're up to like 1480 here in the Vision 98. And that f flex pattern, like if we had Sooth ski come and, and measure the, the flex pattern of all yeah. these skis, this would be way to the left on that, that plotted graph. It is unbelievably soft compared to the skis up here. And if you go back to the conversation that we had to start when we were talking about the stiffness of these skis, you are going to lose some uphill efficiency on mm -hmm. this ski because every step the ski is bending so some of your power and your weight is getting transferred down rather than up. Yeah, and additionally, any, the reason you don't see a lot of touring twin tips is that the skin curves up with the tail as opposed to flat, so yep. you're getting less traction. Yeah, more with, prone to get like that flap too. Yeah. If your tail attachment point breaks free and you look back and your skin is just dragging along yep. behind you, it'll happen a lot more. And, that, and that's one of the nice differences like with this Liberty, with the Origin 106 backcountry versus the regular 106. Yep, keep the tail a little keep flatter. Keep the tail flat, so more traction going uphill. Yep, but super unique ski. If you're shopping for touring and you want a twin tip, you don't have many choices. Right. And this is one of the <laughs> best ones. No, and it's fun. Really agile, too. I mean, you know, even at my weight and a downhill perspective, like, I had a lot of fun on that thing, just skiing groomers. Like, it's just a, it's a fun, quick ski to be on. Yep. Um, next ski, Dina Star M Tour 99. Um, pretty interesting story here. You know, it's very, very similar to the M Pro 99. Yeah, footprint just, share. Yep, just a much, much lighter build. So similar weight to the Vision. We're just about 1,480 grams exactly. Um, and this ski feels like it shares some similarities with the Escaper. Yep. It's just kind of like more aggressive. Yeah, they use basalt in here. They got a longer turn shape. Exactly. Um, I think 22 or 24 meters. You were spot on the first time. 22. 22. In the 186. Yep, and it feels, you know, a little stiffer yeah. than that escaper, too. So pretty similar. Like, the, the reason why I feel like they're similar is the similarities in the tip profile. Yeah. That long rocker, long early taper. Um, this one's just a little bit more aggressive. Yeah, and they still use that hybrid wood core in here, you know, using that polyurethane on the side. So, again, technology filtered in from the Alpine world. Yep, you still get that rocket frame, too. It's yep. just not tight enough. Yeah, no, it's great. You know, super energetic and poppy, a little bit thicker of a sidewall profile here, um, even than we see in the, in the Pro 99. So it's interesting how they use, have to kind of bolster that lighter wood core by adding more of it in the vertical space. Yep. So I think that's pretty cool how they kind of blend the two. Yep. But really awesome. Yep. And we've always talked about these being real skiers, skis yep. in their shape. Um, you know, it is flatter tail, long turn radius. It requires a pretty good skier with good technique. But compared to Escaper, you're getting more power. Right. If you like to ski faster, this is a great choice. And it's a little bit different of a, of a difference between like M Pro 99 and M Tour 99 versus something like Enforcer 94 and an Enforcer 94 Unlimited. Sure. This definitely still has that more touring ski feel. Yeah, I agree. Even though they're only separated by 100 grams or so. But it's interesting. It's got to be more I than meant, that. I meant this oh, and this. Okay. Not this in the, in the metal. Sure. <laughs> you know, that this and like the sense. Enforcer 94 yep. are pretty close in weight, but they just have different feels to them. You notice it, um, and maybe we can, when we get there, we can bring one of these skis back up. You notice it in flex pattern. Yeah. I think that's a big, a big part of that. 
that Enforcer has more of a rounder flex pattern that feels more similar to the flex pattern of its counterpart. Right. So. Uh, I like talking about counterparts. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> and footprint sharers. Yep. Um, and then next key here to finish this side of the wall, um, this is the Solomon Mountain 96 Carbon. Did I get that name right, Bob? Sure. I think I did. I always get confused about the name of these keys. It feels like a lot of different things stacked onto each other. Um, but pretty interesting ski here. I think we're continuing that story of like things just feeling a little bit stronger and stronger as we go in that direction. Very similar weight here, so call it 1,460 grams. Um, what length do we have here? 174. So a little bit heavier in the grams per centimeter measurement. Um, but another ski that's pretty darn strong. I think I did that to the other one too. I'm really breaking you free all the, all the carbon <laughs> and fiberglass in these skis. Um, but very interesting ski. Um, 18 meter turn radius. So a little bit more of a rounder shape than mm -hmm. some of those longer skis that we've looked at. Um, but still very light. You know, a really nice blend here. I like I like this kind of middle swath of these skis because they're still plenty light enough to use a tech touring binding on. Mm -hmm. Your whole setup's going to feel light, but this is starting to give you some, some pretty cool downhill performance in my mind. They use cork amplifier in these right. skis, so that's a technology borrowed from their alpine world and, you know, just those vertical carbon stringers really do a nice job of making this thing very snappy and poppy. And, just gives it that nice stiffness, like we were saying, for both uphill efficiency as well as that edge grip uh, in any type of technical situation. You know, it's not always deep snow. Sometimes right. you're up against the wall and you need the ski to right. hold you up. How about that base, Bob? The base is really cool. I, like, this looks like a painted garage floor, like speckled. It does, yeah. Like, I don't know how better to describe it, but. Yeah, I believe it's recycled material. Interesting. Yep. It's also built with 100% uh, renewable energy, this ski. All right. So we're really telling a, a sustainable story, <laughs> which I think it's nice to have that story when you're talking in the touring world. Right. You know, generally people that are touring aficionados lean more towards uh, being environmentally friendly than if you're pulling up to the resort and you're suburban. I know a lot of tourists that drive suburbans too. <laughs> Hoping you'd say something <laughs> like that. And now we're, oh boy, that one wanted to go. Now we're moving on to this side. Not a whole lot of difference in weight here. Um, this is one of the skis that also follows the footprint of their Alpine counterpart. Oh, I gotta tear that out. We did something weird there, Bob. I guess gotta get it back to zero. So this thing is just has wanted to fall over on me all day. 1,450 grams in this DPS Pagoda Tour 100. Uh, this ski uses the same footprint, same shaping. It's an RP shaped ski. So if you're a fan of that DPS Pagoda 100 uh, RP, the Alpine version, and you're looking for the same type of shape but in a lighter weight, uh, this is your ski. Yep. You know, they use a nice blend of foam to go along with ash in the, in the stringers, uh, polonia wood, as well as algal material. You brought yeah, I up, thought, thought that was super interesting. Yeah, we kind of got into a YouTube rabbit hole about algal material, um, which is basically plastic derived from algae and algae-related biomaterial. Yeah, so, my understanding was, like, it's, it's still mostly plastic but you can get like 20% algae in there. Right, so they're using the, the algal material to bolster the plastic already. Yep. So sidewalls as well as a stringer of algal material yeah, in the this The sidewalls ski. don't look like algae. No, they don't. Like you said, probably mostly <laughs> plastic. <laughs> but very interesting. I, th I thought that was yeah. cool to see that technology in a ski. Yep, so 15 meter turn radius in this thing, just like we see in the regular RP. So it's gonna have that short radius make those nice round turns. People that like that feel uh, will definitely gravitate towards this versus you know, a 24 meter radius in something like the dispatch. Totally, it's the shortest radius up here. Yeah. So I think that, that like, I don't remember where we were when we were having this conversation last time, but it feels like a great East Coast ski to me. 
Yeah, you're going to get good grip. They still have the same two sheets of carbon that they use in yeah. their regular skis. So really just a high-end construction going on here. And if you don't want to flex them because of safety issues, I'll do it. The thing is That's really impressive stiff. impressive that you can get it to bend that much. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, there, I got a little noise you out of it. got a little it. crack out of it. Um, incredibly stiff. Yeah. yeah. So I think there's going to be... Uh, you know, as with, I'd say all of DPS skis, it, you're either going to love it or you're not going to like it at all. Yeah. That seems to happen with their skis. There's not as much of a broad appeal. You're either a DPS, especially with the RP skis. Yep. You're either a DPS skier or you're not. And like, I think that on paper, I'm more of a C2 skier, but on the snow, I actually really like the... Yeah, you I had really a great like time this. on just the normal yep. Alchemist version of this ski. Yeah. So... Or not Alchemist anymore, Pagoda. Pagoda. Everything's Pagoda now, it seems. Everything is Pagoda now, except for koalas. <laughs> They're koalas. <laughs> this thing is definitely going to fall over before this time is up. And then another kind of cool footprint twin here is the Nordica Enforcer 94 Unlimited. Um, we did a nice full review of this last year in an Alpine setting. And we were both pretty impressed with how this thing just handled the resort. You yeah. know, the known quantity, similar to DPS, of the Alpine version of a ski, just with a lighter weight construction, yep. the use of carbon instead of metal to access the performance, uh, and just that enforcer shaping. The fact that that carried through is really appealing to a lot of skiers. That was um, a big part of it, I think. Yeah, ourselves included. Like, yeah. wow, we really like this Enforcer 94. Let's lighten the load, give it a little bit more snap, a little bit more pop. Uh, and this ski is born of that. Yep. So definitely one of those ones that kind of skirts the conversation of is this a touring ski or is it a lighter weight alpine ski? Yeah, and this, this could be a good one for like a shift or a yep. kingpin or something like that and, and use it for both. Then you wouldn't have to make that decision. Yep. Um, but no, I agree 100%. Um, and I think it was it was fun to get to test these pretty thoroughly last year. Um, and it's interesting kind of talking it through the lens of the 104. I think we both agree that like that ski you can pretty much take it anywhere. Right. Like there's yeah. no limitations to where you can ski that ski. This didn't feel quite as at home in the resort or it at least didn't feel as smooth. There were some twitchy moments in this ski that I don't think you got on the 104. Part of that could be the increase in tail rise on that ski, where this ski has a, a much flatter tail like, like the normal Enforcer 94 does. Um, but a lot of people love this shape. A lot of people like this width range. If you want a relatively strong touring ski in this width range and you like the Enforcer shape, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yep, and we're at the mythical 1500 gram mark that I like to use for my non, my totally arbitrary cutoff point of touring dedicated skis. Yeah, so to share, in the past <laughs> two days, I've had to listen to Bob say, this is a touring ski and this is not a touring ski, yep. with the arbitrary cutoff of 1,500 grams. Right. So by that measure, is this a touring ski, Bob? It is because it's in their <laughs> marketing catalog as a touring No, and I still, option. and I think, I, I think more people should be choosing this for touring than resort. Okay. I'm, I'm perfectly willing to go that far. With the 104, it feels like a different story, but this, this felt like its best application is touring ski. And I feel like we're also new to this conversation. Like we're definitely making this up as we go along too with these hybrid skis. So like, there's not like a rule like I just made with 1500 grams. It's, does this work for you and your application as a skier? And how do you choose to use this thing? Well, it's very interesting. You know, I, I, I thought that was interesting that you said, like, we're kind of new to this conversation. And, and it's, I feel that way, but mostly because there's so much more emphasis on this category right. now. Like, I don't feel like we could have had this conversation, or at least it wouldn't have, have been as good of a conversation just five years ago. Right. It's just there, there weren't nearly as many skis that were good to start right. and, and focused on this category. Yeah, no, I feel like a lot of people used to just put some type of te tech binding or variation thereof on their Alpine skis. Right. Or a burly 
you know, backcountry touring ski that's more born of the Nordic world than right. Alpine. Right. So now we get to have these conversations. <laughs> uh, we got Glen Plake ski here. This is the Elan Ripstick Tour 104. So basically the same exact conversation or the same exact build that we saw here, mm -hmm. but pretty significant difference to start in width and I would say in overall feel too. Um, this ski has, let's see, what was the turn radius back here? I think it 18 was or 19? 17.6 okay. and in this ski we go pretty darn long yeah all the way up to 23 yep um, what do you have there for weight Bob <clears throat> just over 1500 grams yeah so you'll this see one here. you know seeing that increase in weight from the 94 here we just get more mass in this ski, yep. so you're gonna have more weight and then going along with that long turn radius we get a very free ride inspired shape so pretty long rocker there in the tip and quite long rocker in the tail too there's not a bunch of splay here it's not really like a twin tip but it has like a very very surfy fun yeah. feel some of the easiest edge release and soft snow that i've ever felt in my entire life i don't know if this was the ski that made us coin the term wiggle factor but no, it, sure, it wasn't. It but this sure is could have been. this is high on the wiggle factor chart. Yeah. yeah, that's all I remember is just being able to make non-catchy turns. Yes, Ext super non-catchy. Extremely easily. Yeah. Yep. Um, I own a pair of these. If you know, if you watch a lot of our content, maybe you know that. I'm really excited to ski them more this year. Yep. I didn't get too many days to ski them last year, mostly because we're just busy doing other stuff, and I didn't have nearly as many up we also didn't have like great snow year last year right so there weren't that many times when i had the opportunity to go on a powder touring mission but that's what i'm going to use this ski for um i think the i think the the right way if you want to call it right or wrong probably the right binding to put on here is still a tech pin binding um i went with a shift and i think that's questionable i think that's this ski is best in the tech world mm -hmm. but if you want that lightweight techy very performance oriented ski but with more of a playful free ride nature this is like it, it, it's hard to do better than this right yeah no super easy easy to turn and ski but also still has that nice floaty performance factor which is yeah. pretty cool and smooth too yeah. you know the same benefit from this central rod that we talked about in the 94 and you know it's a pretty pretty stiff flex pattern or pretty supportive flex pattern underfoot but then they let these tips and tails just mm -hmm. be like super super fun so i think it's like it's a really cool ski and it's almost hard to talk about in this wall because it's so different than like almost anything else up right. here no different design in mind for sure and that's yeah. just kind of the plaque influence coming through in in the form of plastic wood and metal <laughs> yeah no, and it's fun to see Glenn talk about that ski because yeah. he like it's clear that they nailed it for him. Right. And if 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 Glenn Plake likes it, if it's good enough for Glenn Plake, it's <laughs> probably good enough for you. <laughs> I like to think about things like that. Uh, this is a DPS Pagoda Tour 106. Uh, you know, kind of the main reason for having both of these DPSs up on the wall is that they have different shapings. So yeah. this is the C2 version. Uh, so 19 meter turn radius in this one has more camber, less rocker to accommodate that shorter turn radius in the 15, uh, but the same construction. So it uses that aerospace foam, uh, the two sheets of carbon, the algal material. So same construction, different shape, 1530 grams on that ski there. And again, we're seeing just this incredibly stiff flex. I would say this one in almost feels a little bit stiffer. It is, than yeah. Maybe I'm just tired. No, it is stiffer. This is the one that almost yep, cut, stiffer. cut me. Yep. Yeah, I, I came in here first thing this morning and, and did my own flex comparison, just going quickly down the whole wall. And this was so stiff, it almost slipped out of my hand and cut my arm. Yeah, so probably just the extra mass, the extra width, more carbon in here. Yeah, and more camber. More camber, yep. gonna make this thing flex a little bit tighter. Um, but if you're looking for that wider bodied, more direct style touring ski, 
uh, this is a better option than the 100 RP, um, but still has that nice lightweight, super, you know, that carbon feel to it, really grippy. You know, if you're, again, in a technical spot where you need grip and you need predictability and you need precision, this is the thing you want on your feet. You yeah. know, it's definitely gonna hold on tight to anything that's challenging or more technical. Which yep. I think is a huge plus. Yep. Um, I don't think this is the best way to think about the difference between RP and C2, but for some reason in my mind, I like to think about them as east to west. Okay. Just basically like spacing of trees. Yep. That's kind of where my mind goes. Like I just, you know, we've, we've skied this shape at Stowe quite a lot yeah, at, this, years. at this yep. point. Yeah, and it is like undeniable how good that ski feels when you have to wiggle through tight trees. Yeah. Because it's just got that shorter radius, it's got a shorter effective edge, all that stuff. When you transition from those to the C2s, they definitely feel like they take more work to get them to make those same turns. Whereas when you're out west, you don't need to make those turns like that because the trees are spaced further apart. Yeah. So I'm sure there are a ton of people that live out <laughs> west that like RP skis. I'm sure there are a ton of people on the east that like C2 skis. I just, I think that's kind of a fun way to think about the differences in their shape and the differences in the turns that they're going to want to make. I think that DPS has done a great job at making a similar performing ski lighter. So yeah. Really, they've done a yes. great job taking their 106. It feels just like the 106 yeah. C2. Yeah, really does, just with that lighter weight. So I think they've done a really nice job there uh, and definitely come a long way with that tour, the tour category, which is interesting because they, they were always the company known for making lighter weight powder skis. Right. Because of the carbon. Right. But yet they're, you know, take it a step further with, with, this tour version well and i yeah and i think that's like and uh, that's another fun conversation to be had like these skis are more similar to what the the rest of the stuff they make <clears throat> yeah. than like nordica correct yeah whether that's <laughs> that's not a like i don't think there's a, a positive or a negative there right. i think it's just interesting to kind of see how these skis compare to the company's heritage no they've done they're successful in that regard yeah I'd say this company is successful too. Totally, um, and similar story here. Like yep. Liberty's always used bamboo. They've always tried to make their skis lighter. Yeah. And, and then they kind of took it a step further with this ski. Right, so Origin 106 Backcountry, uh, you know, shares a lot with the regular Origin 106. They did take down the rocker a little bit, uh, 1,554 grams on that one there. Uh, but the big difference is in the tail. You know, they really kind of took what was more of a symmetrical rounded shape in the in the shovel and the tip. Yeah. And in the regular origin, that was very similar looking in the tail. Uh, they've really just flattened it and then chopped it. So they've kept a lot of the same personality kind of from, you know, I would say rearward of the binding forward. And then from here back, uh, made it more tour shaped and then lighten the load as well so no metal in this one like we see with the yep. vmt no 1.0 metal. Um, but we do see car the use of carbon in here uh, to access that performance and again just because there's no metal in it yeah doesn't mean it's not going to be a stiff flex pattern yeah i think if you like that free ride mentality of the origin 106 mm -hmm. and you're looking to put a tech binding on that thing and be more efficient in your uphills this is the way to go yeah. Um, you know, a, a difference, but not a wholesale change, I don't think, from regular Origin 106. It's more like tour friendly than it is tour specific. You yeah. Know, especially as we're getting a little bit heavier. Totally. I think you could probably say that about really the rest of the skis with maybe, maybe a couple of them being, I don't know, that's an interesting conversation to have about dispatch. Is that tour yeah. specific or not? Um, but... You know, I think that this is a great ski. Something that I wanted to point out is it, just like the regular Origins, it's got a crazy amount yeah. of, of tip rocker, just from a length perspective. And with that, with the 106 underfoot, I don't often say things like best, but thus far I would say this was the best powder ski yeah, out of powder. anything that we've looked mm -hmm. at so far. 
I think that Glen Plake ski is a very, very close second, but there's something about the spoony shape here. Just yep. gives it an awesome feel and deeper snow. Yeah, just a little bit straighter of a cut and just flatter overall personality than, you know, we talk about the roundness of the origin skis. And yep. this is mostly there, just kind of cuts it off at the end. Yep. So interesting, interesting style. And I'd say kind of the same thing about this Navis Freebird from Black Crows. Um, similar type of tip shape, you know, not quite as dramatic in the rocker, but still pretty low. You know, 102 underfoot, good camber underfoot. Um, you know, I don't want to get into like a European versus America debate, but like this seems to me to be more what European marketing touring is all about, you know, um, versus what we're talking about here with just lightweight, you know, like free touring. I think there's just, they yeah. use different words to say the same thing with skis like this, where it's 1,670 grams. Right. You know, we're getting heavier. We're using kind of an alpine mold, but we're still assigning a touring aspect to it. Yeah. I, I think just, free touring, I, I like that term to describe yeah. these skis. Because the other thing that you see in Europe is like more people gravitating to this stuff. Right. Like you see a lot of people on Transalps and stuff like that in Europe and going super light. Yeah. Where this, I feel like through the European lens would be more of like a big mountain touring ski. Correct. Like a mountaineering tool. Yeah. And like... Which makes sense because it's born in Chamonix. Yeah. You need the sturdiness. Right. For more kind of rugged adventures right, exactly. that are more Alp oriented exactly. than kind of, I mean, the Rocky Mountains are large, but they're, they're not, not the Alps. Same. They're not the same. Yeah. So like, it's definitely, I think that this is kind of a jump into a different geographical zone. Sure. sure. Not to say that it doesn't work well in North America. No, no. And it's hard <laughs> to make those distinctions. But sure. Like, no, I understand what you you're know, saying. I'm kind of like, in, you know, writing the article and thinking and talking about these skis, it's hard to deny that this has a very French aspect to it, a very, yep. alp, you know, that alpine free touring market. Yep. So no, I think that's fair. Pretty interesting in that they don't have an alpine navis anymore. No, it's in, it's really interesting. Yeah. And like, I'll just be honest, I, I wanted to put the new Camix Freebird up here. Mm -hmm. And I, it's not here. It's on our website, so it must be in a different physical location. Um, so I was like, admittedly, a little bit bummed that yep. we had the ski in and not the Camix <laughs> Freebird, the new one. Uh, but I still think it's a great ski. And it's interesting that Black Crows has carried the novice name forward for so long, even though it's now been, I think, three years since they axed yep. the, the resort Navis. Which was great. You know, it was really fun. 102 underfoot. Yep. 19 meter turn radius in this thing. Yeah, this thing's very well rounded. Yeah. It is maybe the, the most well rounded most capable ski in a variety of terrain conditions than anything else we've looked at. Yeah. And if you want to keep weight down on something like this, then you still got to go tech binding. Right. Which is fine. Yep. Like it's still going to be a relatively light setup. Like we're, we're still making marginal increases in weight. We yeah. really only make significant increases towards the very end over there. Yeah. No, but really cool ski and still kind of carrying that, that notion of, you know, free tour forward, I think. Right, and very trustworthy. Yep. You know, and I think we'll see that too when we get to Corvus Freebird, and that's even like more of, right. like that's like an exaggeration of the trustworthy feel. But again, like when you're skiing in the Alps, when you're skiing Chamonix terrain, you need your ski to be trustworthy. Yep. This ski feels more like it was designed as a North America touring ski. Yeah. This is like, a powder touring weapon. And I love how we're just making this stuff up as we go along too. We're really not <laughs> making it up. I can't get my scale on here. But interesting concept to start with this K2 Dispatch 101. Um, I think it's very fair to say that a North America based company is designing their skis for North America. Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> stop, <laughs> it's just, stop telling me I'm making things up. 1,660 grams. Uh, this ski has a functional metal laminate in it. It does. Pretty like cool. Full, full yep. metal laminate. Maybe not, not full, full, 
but the longest metal laminate of anything that we've seen up here by far. Yeah, if you balled up the metal, yes, this has the by, most. By mass, yeah. yep, but by length too. It's like, that's all metal. Right. So I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, long radius, long rocker. Yeah. Uh, 23.6 meters here in this 182. Um, and also to your point that they make this ski in... Did you say 23.6? Yeah. Because it's 26.3. Oh, my bad. I, I knew I had something wrong. It's okay. Could, my eyes are failing me. No, this thing has a huge, yeah. huge turn radius. Yep. Yep. Uh, and they make wider versions of this as well. Yep. So, again, probably more of that North American style that you were talking about. But Yeah, so when I the think... The rocker's crazy on this thing, too. Totally. And that's what I was getting at, like... I thought you, you presented a really interesting point with Black Crows and bringing up mountaineering and yeah. like how you need a trustworthy, strong ski. There are situations in North America where you're in a similar situation, but they're probably, you're more often probably in better snow conditions. Okay. I think that's fair to say. If you're touring in Utah or Tahoe, I think you're often going out when there's really good snow, and I think those are more frequent than when you're touring in Chamonix. Yep. Sure, we can say that we're making that up, but I think <laughs> there's a lot of truth there, and that's where this shape really, really shines. Long, long turn radius, so you're going to get an incredibly surfy, smeary ski. It's yep. never going to feel like it's hooking up and doing a specific turn. And then long, long tip and tail rocker with just a very straight cut. So it's kind of like, it feels like we're taking like surfboard inspiration here to mm -hmm. me. Like it's just, it's, it's really, I, I, think they, they, I think they did a really, really good job with these skis. Um, just, just unbelievably smeary, smooth, surfy, and floaty. Yeah, for, I mean, the tail taper, too, from my end, totally. from my perspective right. here. Is Look like, at that, like, it's just going to knife right through yep. the snow. Yeah, very interesting. You know, when we when we got on these this year, uh, you know, in an alpine setting, skiing downhill, this was, the you can't just tip it, like, if you're not in fresh snow, or else you'll fall you over. You just fall over, yeah. You know, it's, it's a very uh, different feel from a lot of other skis, especially comparing it to something with a 15-meter arc. Right, you know, like where the this, opposite. It, Total opposite. It's like a thing shaped like a water ski. Yeah, but, you know, switch water to snow, and you have the ideal tool for the job. Well, right, and it makes sense. Yeah. Like powder, the way that a ski interacts with powder is more similar to how a ski interacts with water right. than ice. Yep. So it, it, it's really cool to have a ski like this. Like you don't see, you don't see many brands, like, really leaning this far into soft snow application. Yep. And it's cool that they also like built some sturdiness into it with the metal. I don't know. I think K2 nailed it with this ski, but you see it reflected in the price too. These things aren't cheap. Right. I mean, these aren't cheap either. That's true. You know, so there is a price to pay for technology. Right. Um, I guess I was more thinking like through the lens of K2 products. Right. These dispatch skis are yeah, they're up there. They're up there in price, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of technology in here, and I think it's easily justifiable when you look at what they've achieved. Yeah, and really cool just way to take it to the, you know, the nth degree in terms of straight cuts. Right. Really cool idea. Yeah. No, I love it. And we have much wider dispatch skis, too. Are there two wider? There's yes. a 110 and a 120 yep. or something like that? Something like that. Crazy. Um, Another one that we've talked about before and last year, uh, Nordica Enforcer 104 Unlimited, uh, footprint twin of the 104 Free, just with carbon instead of metal. Very similar conversation to 94 in terms of construction. Shaping is where we see it really kind of take on a new life. Um, so 1,650 grams here in this, the 179, I believe. Yep. Um, so carbon top and bottom of the wood core. And then we get the 104 shape, the Enforcer 104 shaping. So like Jeff was talking about with the Vision 98 and having that twin tip shape, uh, we definitely see that amount of splay come through in this 104 uh, to go along with that nice long rocker, 
good splay here. Uh, and then just the turn shape of this thing really sets it apart. Um, we got on these on, on the mountain last year. I would say I was like hesitant at first that it was going to feel the same as a 104 free. And like my impression was that it felt better. <laughs> like, you know, I like the 104 free a whole lot, but this thing just really kind of opened my eyes to what a carbon powered ski with a good shape can do. Yeah. I think it comes down to skiing style, whether yeah. you're going to like like it more or not. I think it, it like that makes total sense to me Yeah, that you skied this and you were like, yeah, I like that more than the Enforcer 104 Free. It just kind of matches the way that you ski. Right. Quicker turns, the ski is snappier and more reactive than the 104 Free. I don't know that I could go as far as saying that I like it more than the 104 Free. I have like a lot of fondness for this ski, but on the 104 Free you can go 60 miles an hour yeah and the ski is just like well, okay you want to go faster i probably put like five solid spring days on this when we had some snow here and in the woods and in fresh snow this that's where this thing really distanced itself for me yeah much quicker from the 104 free. yeah less tiring um <clears throat> great floater super surfy super easy great in the trees uh and just a just a sheer pleasure you know we're creeping up towards 1,700 grams. There yep. are lighter alpine skis in the world than right. this. Cores. Yep. Like every core yep. is going to be lighter like than this. Like a rip sticks right around there. Yep. So, you know, we're definitely getting to the, to the point where it's like, this is a lighter alpine ski. Right. Especially if you're looking at it through the lens of the 104 Free. You say, I love this thing. I wish it were lighter so I could tour on it. And I would say this is more the occasional touring option versus a daily tourer. Um, I think that's the right way to think about this. But not yeah. saying you can't can't use it in a daily touring format, just there are lighter options. Yeah, it's just like, it, it's about your preferences right. and where you put your focus. If this is gonna be more of a daily touring ski for you, then your focus is on downhill performance yep. and you're willing to, to lug around a little bit more weight. Quite a contrast from that dispatch. Totally. 17.5 meter radius in here yep. compared to 26.3 like wildly different and you know what's fun we use the term surfy to describe both of them right it's going to feel different this is going to be more this this ski is going to be rounder would you agree in that assessment a thousand percent so when you're talking about surfy you're still getting some roundness to that yeah it's more like a slarv right where that's that dispatch is like it's almost taking, like Surfy almost doesn't even describe it anymore. I think the biggest difference is that you, you need some speed to right. get this thing to go, whereas this has a broader range, right. uh, you know, from mid-velocity mid down. Right. Um, you can definitely get more out of this, whereas this, and we talk about it with like a Solomon Stance 102 with a, turn, yep. with a longer turn radius. Like you need to kind of get that thing going yep. before it gets active. We've also talked about like, I think I've, I've used the term like modern free ride. Mm -hmm. um, that dispatch is very much along the lines of a ski that likes to go really straight and yep. then perfectly sideways, yep. not round. Yeah, totally. Pretty Whereas this like does, it'll talk back to you if you try to throw it sideways like, like that. Like straight side, yeah. yeah, exactly. And I'd put this new, this wider locator in the straight sideways category too. Totally. And that's what, going back to that conversation that I think we started here, it's like really interesting that, that Armada and K2 both kind of took a new approach to this category and both approached it in a, at least a similar way. Um, 24 meter turn radius. Right. 1,760 grams. 112 underfoot, so we are getting a little bit more mass uh, adding to that weight. You can feel it. Yep, feels like a feels like a ski. Yep, um, actually feels noticeably different than than this ski. Yeah, and there is a 104 that splits the difference between these two. Yep, um, but again, I think the story here is that taper shape, that really smooth tip initiation and engagement. And then just a super straight and flat profile overall. Yeah. You know, there's not a whole lot of camber underfoot on this thing. No. Nope. do have that nice vertical sidewall through the middle part of the ski, but no, not a whole lot of camber and, you know, nice rocker in the front. So 
Uh, obviously one of the better floaters. I think one of the troubles with touring when you get into the wider shapes is that it's just a little bit awkward on the uphills. Yeah. So even right. if it were like super light, you're still kind of like, you have to separate your stance a little bit. Like you won't fit in a standard skin track. No, it is kind of funny. Um, you also like, you just like smash up the skin track because right. your skis are so much <laughs> wider than everyone else's. Yeah. I always feel bad when I'm in a situation like that where my skis are wider than anybody else that's gone up the skin track yeah. so far. And I'm like, oh, sorry, everyone behind me. But if you're if you're blazing your own trail, sure, you know you can set your own width, and then the theory goes if you're doing that, you're the first to the top, and you get the fr and you get the fresh run to yourself, and that's where this 112 with that nice taper shape and a great floaty profile comes in handy. Recommended binding on the back of the ski? What do you think? Oh, I don't know. Shift. 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 Shift or tracer tour. Okay. Um, so kind of interesting, you know, you see that, that the manufacturer is calling out the shift yep. where you didn't, you don't see that over here. Right. No one's calling out a hybrid touring binding over here and you, you start to see it here. Yep. And I would even say that like, I'll go as far as saying that you could put an Alpine binding on this and just use it as a lightweight powder ski I'd in the agree. resort. Yep. It'd be a great choice and for a lighter skier, somebody who doesn't ski tremendously fast. Yep. Why not? And yeah, I mean, I would say I would echo that given the experience I had on the 104 in fresh snow. Right. Like, wow, this is this is great riding the lift on a powder day because it's right. so smooth and easy to use. Yeah. Great floater. Yep. Another one that has hits that kind of straight sideways, straight sideways mm -hmm. mentality. But again, as just a reminder, if you're choosing between dispatch and locator and similar width, dispatch is generally going to feel heavier and stronger. Yeah. Lighter, more agile, heavier, stronger. Yeah. But great new skis from Armada. I yeah, think no, these I locators think awesome. are, are going to catch on and take off for sure. Yeah, and I think, I, you know, I'd love to, to grab a locator 104, um, slap a touring binding of choice on there, yeah. and doing more of a long form review um, this season. And we'll, we'll certainly be doing that on dispatch as well. Um, that, that dispatch 101 is really calling my name for some long-term <laughs> testing, uh, which I think would be great. And I think you're, you're, you're putting it to the test here in Stowe. Yeah, you're for really, sure. Like, Stowe is a great testing ground for a lot of these skis because we get a good amount of snow and we have really technical demanding terrain yep. if you want to go ski it. Yeah, and I think that your binding observation is interesting, even just moving one more ski over. You know, Vocal's website says anything from a jester yeah. to a kingpin V-Works. No, I love that. And I this. think Vocal might be like, I don't know. I think their like mentality and how they're thinking about and talking about their skis is per perhaps a step ahead of some other manufacturers. Well, they were on this Blaze thing years ago. They've yeah. Right. They like learned their lesson, Yep. basically, is yeah. kind of how I think about it, where when these skis first came out, they really leaned towards the touring side. Yeah. That, that was kind of the recommended application. Every media day that we've been on with Blizzard or with Vocal, the Vocal people are skiing Blaze skis. Right. So it's like, I think it like literally was just them skiing them in the resort more often. And they were like, oh, oh these are great. <laughs> these are great in the <laughs> yeah. resort. So it's interesting to see the progression, but still something that like you could go the other direction with and put a tech binding on there and it's still going to be a relatively light package. Like, I think Marcus has a tech binding on his blaze. 1823, this is the long, this is the 186. Um, you know, similar to what we talked about with Rise Beyond, above? Yep, Rise Beyond. Okay. Um, you know, has that longer turn, that longer rocker profile. Yeah. Has the 3D radius, has vocals, Alpine influence. Um, nice, flat, you know, floaty capability here. The rocker starts way down here in the shovel and then similar in the tail. So we do get this nice long rocker profile uh, to go along with the 3D radius, metal underfoot, hybrid multi-layer wood core, suspension tips and tails. Put a lot of stuff in there. Really a lot of stuff in here. Um, and you know the end result is a really floaty ski that actually like gives pretty good rebound. I mean nice yeah. even round flex 
you know, everything from the Blaze 86 all the way up to the 106 is just, like you said, been really fun to ski. Yeah. Um, I think those vocal people started with this being their favorite and then have kind of trended narrower. Well, yeah, the narrower skis are a little bit more versatile, I'd yeah. say. Um, I think my favorite thing about the Blaze is the 3D radius. Yep. Um, Long so in the front. I don't know yours? if I have it on. I yeah, no, I have it on, on your ski. Line. Are I we up to 40 in the tip? 40 tip, 19 middle, 30 tail. Yeah, so we've had a lot of conversations in the past few skis mm -hmm. about turn radius, and, and we pointed out the big difference between dispatch and enforcer. Yeah. Vocal effectively builds like both concepts right. into one ski, which I think is really cool. So if you have that straight sideways mentality, or maybe like you just want to ski that way in a certain pitch, like maybe you're in a tight shoot and that's all you can do where you can also, depending on how you're kind of pressuring the ski and how you're in, like initiating your turn, you can get these skis yeah. to make more of a rounder turn like the enforcer would make. Yeah. So it's, it's really cool how Vocal is giving a lot of their skis the ability to make different turn shapes. And in my opinion, it's by far the most noticeable in the Blaze 106 mm -hmm. because there's it has the biggest difference between tip radius and underfoot radius. So you get like just a huge range of different things the ski can do. It's very fascinating. Well, they're fun to let run. And like, you know, that radius does make sense in here. Certainly like the Katana 108, you feel a different, you know, it's a, it's a similar style of footprint with yeah. that radius, but a different build. So that's where the that's where it's more of a noticeable difference is like you can let it run, but if you're on anything less than deep snow, you're gonna feel it with this. Yep. You know, and obviously it's not a katana 108, but that's just an it's an interesting difference in how different that three D radius applies to different builds. Yep. But really cool to feel in a katana. This thing in soft snow for sure you can feel it. And again, mid-turn, easy to change it up, which is super yes. important. And that's like the biggest benefit. Yeah. Yep. And you don't realize it until you're mid-turn, and then you're like, I want to make it tighter. And you do. And right. you're like, wow, that was great. Right. It's just a, it's an interesting thing. Yep, 100%. Now we got a Blizzard Hustle 10. You know, we could have put the 9 and the 11 in here as well. Yep. Um, I the like 10. the middle, middle ski. Yeah, middle ski is good. The best looking one too. I like the orange. More than the pink eleven? Blasphemy. Yeah. Well if the whole top sheet was pink in the eleven, maybe it I don't know. I like the orange. I like the orange sidewalls. I like the orange base. Yeah. I like how orange this whole situation is right here. I like it too. I just really like those pink sidewalls. And like I, I don't know, this is a good opportunity to just like have a have a discussion here. When we were talking about how vocal like had kind of a learning experience with, with the Blaze skis mm -hmm. and how they were marketing them. I feel like we're going through a similar thing with Blizzard right now, yep. where they originally had a lot of touring specific things to say about the hustle skis, and like to the point where they kind of like sort of disagreed with our assessment of them. And like a lot of that came or felt kind of negative. And like this is one of my favorite skis from all of the skis that I skied last year. Marketing is different so, than experience. Right. So like all of my personal thoughts about the Hustle 10 yeah. are positive. It's just like I wanted I didn't want people to miss out on it. Yeah. Like I didn't want somebody who's spending 90% of their time in their resort to look at that ski on paper and be like <clears throat> That's a touring ski, it's not for me. I, I, it's just it's such a good ski yeah. that I want more people to enjoy it. Um, yeah, I agree. 1,840 grams. You know, it's not like it's light years lighter than Rustler 10. No, and we're like 200 grams heavier than a, the, a, like, what, a Core 105? Sure. Or yeah, any of those guess, lighter but... Alpine skis that aren't in the right. touring right. Cata catalog, category of the catalog. Right. And <clears throat> I think that this is where line is very successful. In and saying, just making the ski and letting letting you decide. Yeah. So like if they didn't put this in their touring category, would more people have the opportunity to ski on it? I think so. You know, like right. the, the it wouldn't have gotten that word wouldn't have gotten passed to the shops or to us and 
I think that we would have been more open-minded. I mean, I think we were in the fact that when we got on it, we were like, what a great ski. Love yep. this thing. Yep. Um, as opposed to someone in a shop who says, well, this is in our touring category. So if you're skiing right. at the resort, this isn't for you. Or they might even like put it on a different, like that might even be in a different part of the store. Sure. And like nowhere near the Rustler 10. Yeah. Where I, I feel like that, that doesn't tell the story as accurately as it could yeah. from an experience perspective. These things are so fun. Yeah. Bouncy, playful, yep. like such a nice flex pattern. We've looked at a lot of skis up here that are like crazy stiff. This ski is supportive, but has like a smooth round flex pattern. So you can kind of manipulate it a yep. little bit more. You can load up some energy more easily. At least I can, cause I'm lighter. Like I just, I had a blast just kind of bouncing around and flicking the ski around and I didn't find any limitations on this thing. No, and we but like ski, mostly skied this thing with a Griffin demo binding. Right. I, I think. Attack demo binding, Griffin demo, I don't even know which one, but a, an Alpine binding. Yeah, with our Alpine boots. Yep. And on, it was super fun. On resort service terrain and yep. lift serve terrain, and it was awesome. Yep. Yeah, you want to talk about like 50-50 hybrid touring resort skis? In my opinion, this is per like pretty much perfect. You don't think it's too heavy? Not really, but again, like I prefer heavier skis generally. Yeah. So basically what I'm saying is I think it's a very well-rounded <laughs> ski that I think does well in the resort too, yeah. but I don't like, I would, if I was buying this ski, I would be putting a hybrid touring binding on it a hundred percent. Yeah. And it would, that's what I would use it for. Yeah. I mean, it's a great, it's a great story and a very interesting conversation. And then I think even the nine and the 11 take it to the, to the different sides totally. where yes. the nine is more touring specific and I the agree, 11 100%. is even more alpine oriented. Yeah, there's not much of a difference in weight between Hustle 11 and Rustler 11. Yeah. So I thought I thought that was interesting. Um, yeah, this this just kind of hits that like 50-50 sweet spot to me. Or 60-40 yeah. or 70-30 or however you want to define right. it as <laughs> your own individual application. Um, really just a nice well-rounded ski here. And I think the biggest difference technologically speaking from this and Rustler is that this has true blend wood core in it. Yep. So I think that it has a different level of sophistication yeah, I than Rustler fair has. to say. Right. So like when you get on this, you're like, oh, it's a footprint of a Rustler, but it doesn't feel like it. Right. It feels totally different and really, really fun. Yeah. And not yep. that the Rustler doesn't. No, this is just more energetic. Yeah. But really cool that they're able to put a new type of wood in the same footprint. Yep. Which is different than what we see other places. No, and it's cool. It, it's cool when a company takes something that's very successful. Yep. And just kind of refines it and, and allows it to be something a little different too. Yeah. That's basically the same thing that we saw with Enforcers. They took a footprint, a proven trusted footprint, and just kind of tweaked it and refined it a little yep. bit. And it's... It's really cool. Yeah, no, it never stops. I like how this, these things just evolve, you know, and and move forward. Whoops, almost dropped the whole sign there. Uh, Black Crow's Corvus Freebird here, just about nineteen hundred grams. Yeah, getting pretty heavy here. Getting pretty heavy, like almost at two thousand grams. We do have that metal underfoot, kind of that Corvus mentality to it. Although this shares the name, it's not like it's not a twin of the Corvus. Like no. it's a different shape, it's a different style of ski. Yep. Um, but if you if you're looking for the wider 107, 21 meter turn radius, 1900 gram ski, you know, pin binding, not quite enough on this. Depends on who you ask, I bet. Yeah. I think if you went to France and you said that, you'd get a lot of people telling you that you were wrong. Yeah. Um, but I know what you're saying, like this might as well be a resort ski. From a weight perspective. Totally. Yeah. Um, I think like, you know, I, I really like the conversation we had about the novice Freebird and Black Crow's heritage and where the company's from. This feels just like it's taking that same conversation to a whole nother level. Like you're a, you're a real big mountain charger. Yeah, like competitive. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I still think there's like some, some mountaineering flair in yeah. here. Uh, like I, I could see somebody putting a tech binding on here and throwing it on their pack and having crampons on their feet and an ice axe and like climbing to some gnarly terrain. Yeah. Um, I also think you could just like throw a pivot on here and have a fun resort ski. 
it's 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 a cool ski. It's I think there's more limited application here than most things we've talked about so far. But you know, Grant yep. here in Stowe, he skis these all the time, loves them. I think it's a great bookend to the Transalp. It's a perfect, yeah, perfect um, bookend. With a 700 gram difference. Yeah. Uh, is, and it kind of just brings up the overall question I think that we're always asking ourselves is, is weight the only thing involved in touring skis? No. Right. There's lots of things. Right. But if you're, if you're looking at it from just a weight perspective, it's so interesting that these two skis can exist on the same wall. Yes. And pretty cool. Yeah, very, very different and different applications. Yep. But I would use the word mountaineering to describe both of them <laughs> in, in some situations. Yep. So I think that's kind of cool too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, very strong ski. You know, it doesn't, like you said, it doesn't share the, the shape or, it, I guess shape, I mean construction either with the right. Corvus but like the mentality is similar. Yeah. Like that ski is like big mountain charger. This ski is big mountain charger with more of a touring flair. Yeah. But it's interesting. There's much lighter 107s out there in the world. Right. You know, that right. aren't marketed as touring skis. Yep. So I think it's just a, it's, it's definitely an interesting conversation to have about marketing expectations, reality, what you want to use the thing for, what you're going to put on it. There's a whole lot going on here. Totally. So very interesting stuff. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I, it, it. You know, I think this this wall turns into a different conversation than most of our comparisons. Um, I yeah. think if you had two completely different people up here, would be a totally different conversation. Whereas our mid '90s comparison, two different people would have a more similar conversation to us. Maybe. Like, I think there's just, there's more uh, input, I guess, into these. Skis. Well, I think it goes back to how we started this conversation yeah. is what boots are you choosing? Right. What bindings are you choosing? What clothing are you wearing? Yeah. Like, how do you categorize yourself as a skier? Then, yeah, I think, like, if you're kind of talking about those different skiers, you could have a different conversation up here. Yeah. I, at the same time, I, I hope that the conversation we had allowed a big variety of different skiers to have a better understanding of their choices up here. Yeah, and kind of the current market as a whole. I think right. that that's a big thing too, is that like, this is where we're at now. You right. know, we have two dozen skis up here. Most of these have a wider and or narrower option, which yeah. I think is just nuts. Like that there's this much that variety. Just in the fact that they exist. That they exist. That yeah. There's this much variety on this wall, but then like times three, and that's just what we have in our warehouse. That's like, yeah. we're not even touching like Rondonet stuff or right. you know, any, any more even fringe stuff. Um, so, in, or smaller companies too, you know, independent totally. companies. So there's way more out there in the world than even these two dozen skis and yeah. their wider and narrower counterpart. Yeah. yeah, no, it's really interesting. Yeah. Like obviously the sport has progressed in, in profound ways but I'm like thinking back to when I was a teenager if somebody like showed me like a mountaineering style backcountry ski I was just like what the heck is that right where now it's like a really important category of right. skis with hundreds of options yeah that ski would be part of a bigger line right within one company's right. touring category yeah so lots a lot of stuff out there yeah so Pretty interesting conversation. Um, hopefully you enjoyed it. If, if maybe you noticed, I don't know. Did anyone notice this was the first time we did a comparison just straight through? A lot. I mean, it's good to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're curious why, let me know in a comment, and I can explain why we were able to do this video just start to finish with no breaks. Very interesting and exciting. Pretty exciting time. Um, so let us know if you have any questions about these skis or anything that we weren't able to fit up on here on the wall as usual. If you've got questions about binding choices, boot choices, anything like that, happy to help. Yep. So let us know if you have any questions, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.